Hello friends and family, this is Pastor Ike, lead pastor for Royal House Chapel International in Pennsylvania. Today I have a quick message for somebody, a quick word, and uh, it is my prayer that this message will bless you. It is my prayer that this message will be relevant to your life. It is my prayer that you find solace and hope and a solution in this message. You know, we are living in a world that is filled with so much ambiguity, a world that is filled with adversities and uh, sufferings and evil. Uh, when you go into the big cities, uh, such as in Philadelphia, you would notice that there is so much going on. When you look at the youth, you see the gun violence and the drugs and the lifestyle. Uh, there is so much things going on. Uh, homes are being broken. People are going through uh, challenges. There is uh, evil everywhere. There is poverty, um, divorce, uh, so many things. Um, the people are stressed. People are tired. People are looking for a solution. People are looking for a change. People are looking for peace. People are looking for joy. People are looking for something. And today, I've come to you to let you know that the solution to your predicaments is Jesus Christ. And so my message to somebody today is this. Jesus is the answer. Hallelujah. Jesus is the answer. He is the answer to that challenge that you are facing. He is the answer to your problems. He is the answer to whatever you are going through. Now, with Jesus, challenges may come. You may still face some difficulties, but you know, when Jesus is in your life, you will be able to rule over these challenges. You will rule over them all. Hallelujah. I want us to look at something in the book of 1 John chapter number 3, verse 8. Please let's go there. Turn your Bibles. Take, take your Bibles. Uh, if you're watching from home, God richly bless you. Thank you so much for uh, welcoming me into your home. And uh, I just want to encourage you, participate in everything that we'll be doing in this place, and you will be blessed. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. It says, He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now, the question is this. Has the Son of God been manifested? The answer is yes. We just read it. That the Son of God has been manifested. He's been manifested. Now, why was he manifested? He was manifested to destroy the works of the devil. Hallelujah. I love how it says works. He didn't just say work. He says works, plural. It means that he is talking about the power of sin and also the products of sin. So we are not only talking about sin, but we're also talking about the products such as the challenges that you're going through, the pain that you're going through, the hardships that you're going through, the financial constraints that you are going through. The Son of God was manifested so that he can destroy the works of the devil. Hallelujah. And today I prophesy into somebody's life that because of the manifestation of the Son of God in our lives, every work of the enemy, every work of the devil in your life shall be destroyed in the mighty name of Jesus. Wherever you are, lift your voice and say, I receive it. Hallelujah. Listen, today, I want you to benefit from God's grace. I want you to benefit from the manifestation 
of the Son of God. I want you to come out of that slavery, that bondage, that pain that you have found yourself in, that difficulty that you have found yourself in, that negative situation you are going to come out, that negative thing, that curse that you encountered in your father's house, that you encountered in your mother's house, you are going to come out of it in the mighty name of Jesus. It is my prayer that the Lord God will help you that you will come out and walk in the newness of life. Hallelujah. I love this scripture in the book of Colossians. Let's go there, Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. Hallelujah. Oh, do you love your Bible? Do you love your Bible? You just say, I love my Bible. I love my Bible. Because the Bible has the word that is able to turn your life around. It says, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Nailing it to the cross. Nailing it to the cross. Nailing it to the cross. This means that when Jesus was being nailed to the cross, you know, the people who were doing that thought that they were, they were nailing a human being to the cross. They thought it was just a human being, but something was also happening in the realms of the spirit. It wasn't only a human being, but also our legal indebtedness was nailed to the cross. Our legal calamities, in other words, those, those punishments that were supposed to come to us legally were nailed to the cross. Our pains were nailed to the cross. The curses were nailed to the cross. The poverty was nailed to the cross. That which you deserved was nailed to the cross. I don't know what punishment that you deserved. Maybe you may have done certain things in the past and you know that you deserve to be punished, but I've come to tell you that they have been nailed to the cross. Hallelujah. They were all nailed to the cross and he canceled the record of charges oh, against us. Every record against you, every record against your life, every record against your marriage, against your children, it has been wiped out. The handwriting that was written against you has been wiped away. Those negative things that have been written about us from the pit of hell, that has been written about us on satanic altars, have all been wiped away, nailed to the cross. Those negative things from the archives of men and women, they have been nailed to the cross. Somebody say it's been nailed to the cross. Hallelujah. That is our faith. That is our belief. That is what we know. The ordinances were nailed to the cross. The handwritings were nailed to the cross, which includes your sicknesses, which includes your pain, which includes your sorrows, which includes all those challenges. They've all been nailed to the cross. Listen, brother, sister, I want you to know that your shame has been nailed to the cross. And not only that, but the Bible says that he triumphed over all principalities. Uh, the principalities are those spirits that are fighting you, those spirits that bring accidents your way, those spirits that are responsible for those demonic cycles in your life. Those are the principalities. And the Bible tells us that he triumphed over the principalities. He made a public spectacle. He made a show of them. Hallelujah. Every principality that is fighting you today, I've come to tell you that you have the dominion over those principalities. Those principalities that are responsible for the accidents in your life. Those principalities that are responsible for your pain and, and for the calamities and for the evil in your life. My God, the Lord has made a public spectacle of them. He has triumphed over them. He has overcome them. Somebody shout wherever you are and say they have been overcome. And that is why today I want you to know that you have the victory. Praise the Lord. 
the Son of God was made manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. The works of the devil. Plural. The works of the devil. Not just one work, but many works of the devil. He has destroyed it. Listen, they've all been destroyed. I don't know what you are struggling with. I don't know the challenges in your life. Maybe you are struggling with the power of sin. The Lord has triumphed over those things. They've been nailed to the cross. Maybe it is the power of death. It's been nailed to the cross. Maybe it is fear. It's been nailed to the cross. And that is why the Bible says that we don't have the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. You don't have the spirit of fear. I don't care how you feel. I want you to know that that fear is not real. That fear is just a mirage. That fear is an outside force. You don't have the spirit of fear because it's been nailed to the cross. The spirit of oppression, the spirit of possession, they've all been nailed to the cross. In the spirit of manipulation in your life, I want you to know that it's been nailed to the cross. The spirit of strange diseases. Sometimes you just live in your life and out of nowhere you see a strange disease. It's been nailed to the cross. That spirit of calamity which brings you bad news every day, every moment. There is something happening in your life. I want you to know that it's been nailed to the cross. The spirit of failure, the spirit of faithlessness, the spirit of disappointment, the spirit of poverty is being nailed to the cross. I just want somebody to get ready because a heavy amount of money is about to hit your bank account. Somebody shout hallelujah wherever you are. Glory. It's been nailed to the cross. So, so now what do we do? What do we do now? Pastor Ike, you are here saying it's been nailed to the cross. So what, what do I do now? We, number one, we need to connect to the Son of God. That is your assignment. You need to connect to the Son of God. And also to stay connected to the Son of God. In other words, you have to be born again. You have to give your life to Jesus. You have to give your life to Christ. When you give your life to Christ, you are staying connected to him. You are becoming one with him. And so you are able to partake of his blessings. And so you are able to partake of his finished works on the cross. And if you are already connected, I want to encourage you to stay connected. Keep on working out your salvation. The Bible tells us to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Keep on working it out. Keep on walking in the grace of God. Hallelujah. Another way that you stay connected to Christ is by taking the Holy Communion. Oh yes, I'm talking about the blood of Jesus and the body of Jesus. You eat the body and the blood of Christ, because the body and the blood is a symbolism for Jesus. So you stay connected to him by eating, partaking in the Holy Communion. He tells us in his word to do this in remembrance of him. When you eat the body and the blood of Jesus, you assume his glory. And you position yourself to be able to subdue the powers of darkness. To destroy the works of the devil. Number two, the second thing you must do is that you need to have faith in the Son of God. Have faith in the Son of God. Have faith. Now, when we talk about faith, faith is a speaking spirit. So, in other words, you need to confess. Confess the word. Keep on speaking the word. If Jesus has made you a victor, continue to say, I am victorious. If he has taken away the fear, continue to say, I don't have the spirit of fear. If he has made you more than a conqueror, continue to say, I am more than a conqueror. If he has given you the power to tread upon serpents and upon scorpions and upon all the powers of the enemy, you got to confess it and say, I have the power to tread upon serpents and upon scorpions. Your confession. That is faith. That is faith. Faith. You confess 
and also you walk in the reality of it. So not just confession, but also walking in the reality of it. Hallelujah. Now I want us to look at something real quick in the book of Mark chapter 2. And we are going to look at how um, Jesus demonstrated destroying the works of the devil in somebody's life. I want us to take a look at it. How Jesus demonstrated destroying the works of the devil in somebody's life. Mark chapter 2. Let's go there. Oh my God, I love my Bible. <laughs> glory, glory. It says, and again he entered Capernaum. After some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Two, immediately many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. He preached the word to them. So, so the place was packed. And Jesus was preaching the word to the people. Just preaching the word. Now, something very remarkable happened on that day. Whilst Jesus Christ was preaching, a paralytic man was brought in. A man who had been paralyzed from birth. They brought him in. His friends, four of his friends, they had to lower him down from the roof. Down to Jesus. Because they knew that there, is, there was a miracle in store for him. And the scripture tells us that when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, son, your sins are forgiven. Hallelujah. Your sins are forgiven. And he healed him. Hallelujah. Now, now some people were not very happy that his sins were forgiven. And so they said, Jesus, you are blaspheming. They weren't so happy about the situation uh, but Jesus still forgave him the sins anyway. They wanted him to continue in the sins, but Jesus forgave the man his sins so that he could receive his healing. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. I want you to know that if Jesus did it for this man, he will do it for you too. If Jesus destroyed the works of the devil in this man's life, I want you to know that he will do it for you too. Oh, shout hallelujah. Glory. Now, there are a few lessons that we can learn from Jesus and also from this text. Number one, the word of God creates an atmosphere for miracles to happen. Jesus was preaching the word of God when the man came in. He was paralyzed since birth. It, it was a very hopeless situation. However, because of the word, an atmosphere for miracles was created. An atmosphere for the miraculous was created. So the word of God creates an atmosphere for the miraculous to happen. And that is why you should always have the word of God in your home. Always have the word of God in your life because it creates an atmosphere for the miraculous to happen. Hallelujah. Second lesson. The second lesson is that the word of God releases your faith and positions you for a miracle. It releases your faith. <laughs> it positions you for a miracle. We all know the scripture that says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. And so faith comes by hearing. So the word of God positions you for miracles. It positions you for miracles. To happen. Hallelujah. It releases your faith. Tonight it is my prayer that somebody's faith would be released. As a result of the word of God that is coming to you. I, I am preaching the word of God right now. And I encourage you. May your faith rise in the name of Jesus. Number three. The word of God also keeps and sustains your miracle. Listen to this. The miracle you received by the word must be sustained or kept by the word. There are people that when they receive a miracle, right after that they forget about the word of God. They walk out of church. But I've come to let you know that the same word that, sustain, that gave you the miracle is the word that is going to sustain the miracle. So stay connected. Number four lesson. Anytime you hear the word, 
It means that a miracle is about to manifest in your life. When you hear the word of God, just know that a miracle is about to happen. Just know that there is a miracle close by. Just know that a miracle is imminent. Oh my God. And somebody, you are hearing the word today. I want you to know that a miracle is imminent. There is a miracle close by. Something is about to happen. Hallelujah. The word of God is about to become flesh in your life. And you are about to behold his glory. You are on the verge of a miracle. When you are close to the word, you are close to a miracle. Hallelujah. Stay close to the word because that is where miracles happen. It is the realm of the miraculous. Notice that Jesus himself was the word made flesh. Once upon a time, Jesus was the word. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. That is Jesus. He was the word, but he was made manifest. Hallelujah. He was made manifest. Just as Jesus was made manifest, I want you to know that that word of prophecy can also be made manifest in your life. Number five, when the power of sin is broken, the works of the enemy is also broken in your life. Because sin is the source of all the works of the devil. All the works of the devil, the source is sin. But when the power of sin is broken, the works of the devil is also broken in your life. And that is what Jesus did for us on the cross. He broke the power of sin. That is why you should connect. Connect to Jesus. And in him, you will also have dominion over sin. So you will notice that in the scripture that we just read, the, one of, the first thing that Jesus did was that he said to the man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. He said this because in order for this man to be liberated from the works of the devil, his sin had to be forgiven. Now, when these sins are broken, this is what happens in your life. You will then arise. Hallelujah. When sin is broken in your life, you arise. So Jesus Christ, after breaking um, the sin and also healing this man, he arose. And I see somebody arising right now. You, you've been down for far too long, but you are going to rise again in the name of Jesus. The second thing he said is that take your bed. Take your bed. Take your bed. It means independence. You see, when the power of sin is broken over your life, you are able to walk in independence. And he said, go to your house, your house. Go and own your house. Go and own your house. So when the power of sin is also broken, there is also recovery and there is restoration in your life. When the power of sin is broken in your life, according to the scripture that we just read, you experience restoration. From this story... In 1 John chapter 3, which is our text, it has been confirmed that the source of all sins is the devil. All the problems that we go through, it's also sin. So Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. Today it is my prayer that your sins will be forgiven. Hallelujah. May your sins be forgiven. Maybe you're looking at me and you've not given your life to Jesus. May your sins be forgiven. May your sins be forgiven. The seventh thing is that God's praise is in your miracle. God receives praise when a miracle happens in your life. And so when it comes to uh, your, 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 your miracle, it is non-negotiable. Your testimony is non-negotiable because that is where God's praise is. So you, you, the Lord blessed this man and healed this man and he received praise. Somebody is about to receive a praise today. Somebody is about to receive a miracle today. And that miracle is going to give praises to the most high God. Hallelujah. Oh, wherever you are, say, I receive a miracle. Oh, just say, I receive a miracle. Hallelujah. The eighth and final thing is that sin does not walk in isolation. Sin does not walk in isolation. 
There will always be people who want you to continue in your sins. There will always be people who want you to continue in your hardships, in your sins, because they know that your sins are connected to your hardships. And that is why, um, from the story that we just read, the people were very angry with Jesus when he said that the man, the paralytic man's sins were forgiven. They weren't happy about that. They wanted him to continue in the sin. As long as he was still suffering and sin was the reason for the suffering, they didn't care. They wanted him to continue in it. There will always be people in your life who will encourage you to sin. There will always be people in your life who will encourage you to do the bad stuff. But listen, I've come to tell you that dissociate yourself from them. Break away from them. Those people who encourage you to sin, come out from their midst. Now, if sin does not work in isolation, then I also want you to know that righteousness should also not work in isolation. What do I mean? When you come out of the company of sinners, you have to get into the company of the righteous. When you come out of those who have been encouraging you to sin, who have been encouraging you to do all of those bad things, you need to now come into the company of the righteous. Come into the right company. Come to the right people. Come to the people of God. Join the people of God. Join the saints. That is where you will find encouragement. That is where you will be motivated. That is where you will be built. That is where your faith will rise to the glory of God. Through unity to Jesus, there is nothing we can't conquer. If you have this faith, we are going to achieve victory together. Let's stay united with Jesus Christ. That is the secret to a life full of joy and full of peace. God richly bless you. Thank you so much uh, for connecting. If you are in the Philadelphia area, I just want to encourage you, join us in church every Sunday at 5400 Fen Boulevard, Drexel Hill, PE. Bye-bye. Hello, everybody. This is Pastor Ike, and I'm here with my beautiful wife. And today we come in your way from Royal House Chapel International in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And we just want to invite you to join us in church this and every Sunday at 10 a.m. The address is 5400 Fen Boulevard in Brexel Hill, Pennsylvania. Come on, let your feet get heavy. Let's go. Let's go. Come on. Jehovah, I trust. I trust.